This would be 1989. I fell. That's one of the times I fell down an open stairwell in a newly constructed house. So the stairs, the stairs were actually in there. And I didn't just like tumble down them. I stepped over into an empty space in the hallway. Had my head up because I was rolling paint on the ceiling. I stepped over into it and I landed flat on my back and my head um, on the steps. And the edges of those steps went into my back. And um, that hurt. And there are certain days when I can tell you where every one of those steps touched my back because they're sore today. And that's been, what, 19, yeah, that's been 30 years ago. Yeah, 1989, 30 years ago. So to this day, I have little places in my spine that are sore on certain days, and it's got to be related to the weather. So today's one of those days. So, when I get my new body, I've asked God to not let me use it and fall down stairwells and stuff like that. <clears throat> God, don't let me abuse the next one like I've done this one. Amen. 1 Corinthians 13. Y'all are quiet today. It's quiet today. You'd think this was daylight savings time chains or something like that. You lost an hour of sleep. 1 Corinthians 13. We are studying the love of God. And um, in 1 John 4... Um, and we're, we're going to be in 1 Corinthians 13, but I mentioned this last week. 1 John 4, 8. He that loveth not, knoweth not God. For God is love. And there are a lot of religious people in the world who say they worship God. There, and, and I would limit that statement to those who say they are Christian or Jewish, who say they know God. Uh, even liberals, conservatives, it doesn't matter. But they don't understand, nor do they believe very much in love. And I'm not, that was a word when I was little, I used to, thought it was girly to say it, so I never would say it. But... Um, I understand a little bit now what it means and what it represents. And it is at the very core of Christianity. If you don't understand love and you don't love anybody except yourself, you don't understand God, you don't understand the Bible, you don't understand Jesus, you don't understand what is the essence of Christianity. I would say that it doesn't require love to be a Muslim. Islam is not a religion, they, I don't care what our politicians try to paint it as, it's not a religion of peace, it's not a religion of love. Uh, it, is an, it is, and this, this is what gets me about liberals. They're all about importing Muslim immigrants into this country. But out of all the nations in the world that are the most fierce haters of anybody that's not like them, it's Muslims. They hate everybody who is not their brand of Islam. And I don't mean they just don't like them. They hate them, and they have been instructed to kill them. That's their religion. And so I don't, I, to me, importing Muslims into this nation is, does not have anything to do with humanitarianism. It has everything to do with pushing out Bible Christianity, which stands in the way of liberalism. That's my political statement for the day. Actually, it's probably not going to be the last one, so just hang on. But, uh, it, it, and other religions, um, even the religion of Hinduism, they say it was a religion of peace and love. But, if you, if you don't happen to be 
they still practice the, the class system in India and in other nations where they, where they practice Hinduism. They believe in reincarnation and they believe in karma. And that is that whatever condition of life that you receive is because you deserved it because the way you lived the last life. And so if you're born in poverty in India and born of a low class, you can count out ever getting out of that class for as long as you live because they say you deserved it. Okay? That's not love. That is not love. And they still practice that. And they, and they practice it to the point of, and it ha- a lot of it has to do with the color of your skin. If you're a dark-skinned Indian, it's, be- it's because you're of a low class and the universe doesn't like you as much as it likes the people who are lighter-skinned. And that's what they practice. There's very little love in that one. In fact, almost none. Other religions. Judaism. Judaism is a very racially oriented religion. And um, talk to Orthodox Jews and get to know them a little bit and you'll find that out very quickly. Go on on the internet and read their websites. Not anti-Jewish websites. Read their websites. And I've read some of the Kabbalah-based websites Orthodox Jewish websites and they still to this day believe that the only true people of God are the Jews and nobody else nobody else can qualify to receive the blessings of God other than them Jesus was born as a Jew but he came to show that that wasn't it that was not God's way Um, God has always been a God of love And uh, even in the Old Testament, even with Adam and Eve, God loved them so much that even though they broke the one law that God instituted in the Garden of Eden, they broke that one law, and yet God loved them enough to clothe them himself, which was a sort of a symbol of God's righteousness being on them, God covering them in his righteousness. So to understand Christianity is to understand what true love is all about. Uh, we read that verse a while ago in, in uh, 1 John, uh, where was it? 1 John 4, 8, God is love. So when you look at 1 Corinthians 13, the word charity, and we started in this last Sunday morning, understanding what charity, how God defines charity. And that charity is that unconditional love that you give to God or that unconditional love that you give to other people that says, I will do for you whether or not you do for me is irrelevant. I will continue to do and I will give and I will show you my love. Whether you show me that love back or not doesn't matter. I'm just going to continue to do it. That's the kind of love. You want to understand God? You understand Christianity? That's the kind of love that you must understand. And you say, well, I've never received that in my life by people. Doesn't matter. God wrote it in you. We have, the Bible refers to what's called natural affection. It is in our nature to be kind-hearted towards somebody that we see that is suffering. Or to look at somebody's condition that's not so good and it is in our nature to be compassionate toward that person but we know that one of the signs that we're in the last days is is that natural affection they are without natural affection Paul said that means that they can go and kill somebody kill somebody innocent or they can have hatred towards somebody and it just and it does not bother them at all. Um, in fact, there are people who do not love anybody in this world except themselves. And I'll tell you who's first on my list. On that list is a woman by the name of Joyce Myers, because she rolled out a teaching here a few years ago, and I just I could not believe what I was hearing. She was going to teach this idea about the second commandment. That Jesus gave love your neighbor as you as yourself and her teaching was that it is impossible for you to love your neighbor until you learn how to love yourself and I'm going you're a witch you know what you're just an idiot witch 
Um, that is the stupid, I keep saying that's the stupidest thing. There, then everything that I think of must be on a list at the bottom of the stupidest things in the world. But that was one of them. Because most people in this world do not have to learn how to love themselves. We automatically do it. We'll automatically do for ourselves when we won't do for another living soul or thing in this world. We'll do for ourselves. Loving ourselves is not the problem. We love ourselves too much is the problem. And then we, when you love yourself too much, you don't love God, you don't love other people. So she doesn't know anything. If she takes all this money from everybody but doesn't give it out, that's a problem. So look at verse... Uh, 1 Corinthians 13, look at verse, uh, we'll pick it up verse 3, since I mentioned that statement. Though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, though I give my body to be burned and have not charity, it profiteth me nothing. Charity, this is what we covered last Sunday, charity suffereth long and is kind. So it has patience toward people, it suffers long with them, uh, it is kind to people, we have a tendency to think that, that that person needs to get what they've got coming, which is what the word karma is. And I do not, I hate that word. I hate when people say, eh, that's karma. I believe in karma. I don't. I believe that by grace, we don't get what we deserve. We don't. God, now God judges people, yes. But to say that you only get what you deserve, and basically, this whole idea of karma is a, is a religion of good works. That if you do enough good works, then the universe, not God, the universe will bless you in the next life, and you'll get it back the next life. And I do not believe that. I believe in grace, not karma. Um, but it's the idea that if you deserve bad things, then I'm going to give you bad things because that's what you deserve. But that's not kindness. That's not charity. And that is not kindness. Uh, consider how we raise children. We give things to children. From the moment they're born, we give them, in fact, from even before that, the mother in, his, in her womb is providing for her child even though the child has not done anything good or bad, the mother is providing for that child. And then after the child is born, Jesus taught this example. Which one of you fathers would not give your children good things? And we do. We feed our children. We clothe our children. We protect our children. We, um, we house our children. We give them gifts on their birthday. We probably told them when they were little, if, you better, if you're good, then Santa Claus will come. If you're bad, Santa Claus won't come. But lo and behold, he comes. Well, not really. What was I thinking? <laughs> but that was, the, that was the point. We still give them gifts. Whether they are on the naughty list or not, we still do good things for our children. Why? We love them. Even when they're adults. And we continue to do good things for them. We do it because we love them. Even if they get themselves in a bind, even if they get themselves in trouble, we still do things for them. That's natural affection. That's charity. That's loving them without getting anything back. Uh, and a word of advice to people. Uh, Lisa and I settled on this years ago. If you're going to loan money to your adult children or loan anything to your adult children write it off instantly as a gift okay as a gift because you'd be surprised at the number of people who take their own children to court and sue them for unpaid loans which is I don't know maybe I don't know I can't judge everybody maybe their child had it coming I don't know but Lisa and I decided years ago that if we ever loaned anything to our children, that we would not hold it against them if they didn't pay it back. Okay? And I'm just saying that's, that, that'll, keep their, that'll keep the family fights down to a minimum. But anyway, that's what that's talking about. Charity is kind. Um, 
Let's see here. Verse, yeah, back and still in verse 4. Charity envieth not. We touched on that last Sunday. Charity vaunteth not itself, is not puffed up. That's sort of along the same lines. Um, Paul said that knowledge puffeth up. And one of the things, and I really believe this, Paul himself was a recipient of this. Paul mentioned, and we had just talked about this in 2 Corinthians 12, when God was going to take Paul and set him aside to be the apostle and to give him the revelations that God gave him, one of the things that God gave to Paul along with those revelations was a thorn in his flesh. Paul knew what that was about. He asked God three times to remove it. God said, my grace is sufficient for you. And Paul understood what that was about. Paul's nature, and you can see this in him, at, you know, show up even after he's saved at certain times. He's pretty, he's pretty hardcore. Paul's whole life was serving religion. Even before he became a Christian, he's a zealot for the law. And he is going about to serve the Sanhedrin, serve Gamaliel, the high priest. And he's on his way to go kill Christians on, on his road to, Dismas to Damascus. And he is serving his religion. He doesn't have time for a wife and a family, doesn't need one. And so that's his dedication. That's what, and he is hardcore about it. When he is converted and is saved... God separates him out, teaches him these revelations then that we learn from Paul, the explanation of these mysteries and these secrets that are found in the Old Testament. We have our understanding of those because of Paul. Paul still remained throughout his life unmarried. And so we know that he was 100% lifetime, day in, day out, dedicated to serving God. And you can get pretty puffed up over that. And so Paul said, because of the abundance, the revelations given me, there was given me a thorn in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to buffet me. That was God's way of reminding Paul, you're not really any better than anybody else. Look at the list in the Bible. Go to Hebrews 11. Look at the list of those who died in faith, those who lived in faith. You're, when you look at what the Bible records, see if the Bible... If the Bible was a book written by men to promote a religion, they would have never included these men's sins in the book. Would have never recorded David's uh, uh, adultery with Bathsheba. Would have never recorded the stories about Samson, how he used to like the ladies. Would have never recorded Judah uh, being in bed with what he thought was a prostitute, he ended up being his own daughter-in-law. Would have never included those stories of Sarah laughing in, Jesus, in God's face, lying to him about laughing about it. Would have never included those stories. Would have covered them all up because religious people sh could do no wrong. But God made sure those stories were included in the scriptures to give us understanding like what God said about Elijah. Elijah was a man of like passions as you and I. Meaning that he had the same temptations, the same lust, the same eyes, same brain, same body, same flesh, same everything as you and I. And God did not pick him because he was better than everybody else. God picked him because he knew he could use him because he wasn't better than everybody else. God bless you. <laughs> Boy, it must be in the air today. But anyway, charity is not puffed up. And if we're not careful, I've said this before, we'll take off our fundamentalist ideas. We'll take our, we have the King James Bible. We have the pure doctrine. We have pure this. We have pure that. We will elevate ourselves above everybody else We'll ele elevate ourselves above people who don't believe what we believe, who don't practice what we practice. We'll think that we practice the superior religion above everybody else, but then everybody else in the planet believes that same exact thing. We'll puff ourselves up against people and we won't love them. And the whole point of what Paul is saying here is, yes, believe the right thing, but don't forget to love unconditionally those who don't believe it. 
Don't forget to love them. Don't forget to do things for them. Don't forget to give to them. Don't forget to help them along the way. We're going to feed people uh, in Kenya, coinciding with a pastor's conference we're doing out there. When we feed them, we don't ask them for money. We don't ask them for loyalty. We don't demand that they, in order to receive the food, we don't demand that they must be loyal listeners of Echo Yokan Radio. We do ask them to sit down for a Bible study. I think that's something easy. We don't force them. We got accused. I'll never forget. This made me mad. The first time we fed people and they sit down and they hear one of the Bible studies that we do uh, before the feeding and about eight people got saved. And then, of course, you know how mouthy people are on Facebook and people started mouthing off about, well, of course they got saved. You fed them which really infuriated me. I did not feed them, we did not feed them to make them get saved or to make them feel guilty about not being saved. We just gave the gospel. They wanted to do this. You just, when you're feeding people, that's, that's how you find the hungry ones. Amen? And that's what we did. So, and we've fed people since then And nobody has gotten saved, just a couple of times. Does that mean we should stop the program? No. Not as long as God is blessing it the way he has. Not going to stop it. We're doing the right thing. We're giving in an unconditional manner to people that will never receive anything back from them ever. Never will. But we do it anyway. And then... We don't go around bragging about it. That's charity being puffed up. Uh, Verse 5. Charity doth not behave itself unseemly. What does that word mean? Unseemly. Anybody know? Anybody want to look it up? Unseemly. Inappropriately. Okay. Okay. Loving a guy telling his date, oh, honey, I love you. And then he's got his hands all over her. And she don't want it. Okay? Well, he's trying to soften her up. That's what he's trying to do. That's, that's one way of looking at it. Behaving unseemly. Another way is doing good for somebody. Uh... But really, you have very underhanded intentions and very inappropriate intentions, not necessarily of a dirty nature, but you have other intentions as why you're doing it that way or why you're being nice to them or you're still trying to gain something from them, whether over the table or under the table, uh, whether overtly or covertly, you're still trying to gain something from them. And you're going to behave in an unseemly manner. Uh, The next one is, seeketh not her own. And all of this just kind of does go together. It's all a way of defining a love that we can have toward people where I'm going to do this so long as I get something back for it. But if I don't start getting some attention here, I'm not going to love and I'm not going to give anymore. That is seeking your own. And it boils down to Joyce Myers again. She will love people and she will teach people as long as they make her wealthy. And she will fill them full of promises as long as she continues to get rich off of it. Her whole motivation. And she would almost tell you this because of what she believes. And I've heard her say that God has made her wealthy 
because she deserves to be wealthy. That was out of her own mouth she said that. And what happened was in 2004, the St. Louis Post-Dispatch wrote a series of articles on her that didn't paint her in a really bright, shining light. Made her look bad. So she immediately called in some favors, I guess, or something like that, and Channel 5 uh, sent a reporter out there to kind of do an interview with her to kind of kind of make her look better than what the Post-Dispatch article meant. I've still got the Post-Dispatch article somewhere. I kept it. Because I'm going, I think this is telling the truth of who she really is. And she said in the interview, I am wealthy because I deserve to be. She thinks she deserves to be, so let her be wealthy. Let her have Joel Osteen's best life now. Might as well. But she always seeks her own first. I know somebody who has known quite a few people that has worked for her. And he's told me stories about what goes on there in that office. And it's not pretty. Okay? So, think of a church. Should we, should we try to reach out to people and help people so long as we think we're going to get maybe new church members in as a result of it? Or maybe, you know, we're going to get, uh, it, when we bring people in and become members, obviously they're going to give more in the church bank account. It, should that be why we do what we do as a church. Never. Never. But, it doesn't take long if you, if you read Purpose Driven Church by Rick Warren. It doesn't take you long to figure out that Rick Warren's whole purpose for writing that book was a principle called pragmatism. In other words, if it doesn't bring in the most amount of people into the church building, then we won't do it. If it doesn't bring them, if it's not the most efficient way of getting people in to sit in the seats, then we won't do it. We will only do what works to get people into the pews. That's what I mean by being pragmatic. Pragmatic is a, I mean, it's not a bad term. You know, you could say it's a way of not wasting time or not wasting energy or not wasting effort. But let me tell you God's view of it. When you give and you love somebody and you do for them, whether or not they're going to do something back for you, then that's never a waste of time, energy, effort, or resources. Never. Because that's the kind of love that God gives. God has given His only begotten Son to everybody on this earth who has ever lived. He is willing to forgive all of their sins, but most of these people will never ask God to forgive them. They will never accept God's free gift. They will waste it. So, if you want to be a pragmatist about charity and love and the gospel, then become a uh, Calvinist. Because Calvinism says that Jesus only died for the elect. He didn't die for everybody else. So therefore, God's gift is not wasted on those who don't deserve it. And I am not a Calvinist. Um, seeketh not her own. It's not easily provoked. We all know what that one means. Not easily provoked. Give me an example. I won't do that. I won't ask you what provokes you, what pushes your button. Okay? But everybody's got a button, don't they? Everybody's got a button. Some of you got several of them. And I'm trying to think of a good example of how to say this without bringing out too many particulars about people. But it's not, if you, let, if you say you love somebody, 
but then make demands on them that they must never push your buttons. Do, they, do you really love them? Loving somebody means that they can push your buttons and you'll not do anything about it. Like road rage. I'm guilty of it. I am, well, I've never shot anybody. Never hit anybody's car. Okay? But there's something in me goes all the way back to being five years old and not wanting anybody to get in line ahead of me. And for some reason, I get on this little stretch of Highway 21 outside of Hillsboro, and when somebody starts to pass me, I hit the gas every time. And I'm going, they're not going to pass me. They're not going to do it. They're not going to do it this time. And I always say, go, Mike, what are you doing? I get, at least there, I get easily provoked. Do you understand what I'm saying? And the nature, and I'm just going to throw it out to you. Especially with men, but it, I wouldn't say especially with men. I could say it'd be with women too. In a marital relationship, even in a family relationship with parents and their children. If you have set conditions toward the people in your family that you'll love them so long as they never make you mad, you're going to be a lonely human being. Very lonely. Because my wife has made me mad a time or two. I've made her mad a time or two. Or three or four or five or at seven or nine or twelve or... And at some point in our marriage, we quit fighting about it. We quit going after each other on it. Because we decided that loving one another was more important than the little petty issue of getting mad and winning an argument. Okay? I know that everybody has a limit. I get that. But I'm not talking about someone who just continues to abuse and go out, step out of the marriage and all kinds of things. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about just day-to-day -day life between people who say they love one another. I could extend that to church members. People who are, we're supposed to be the example of love and charity to the rest of the world who absolutely knows nothing about it. And yet it seems like that there are lost people who know a lot more about charity than church people do. Because we fight about everything. Or at least that's the history of it. And we should not be easily provoked. And now that does not say um, provoked at all. Because Paul had a line. Jesus had a line. Jesus went in to the temple. And what did he do when he first stepped foot in the temple? He wasn't even nice about it. He didn't say, gentlemen, what are you guys doing? This is wrong, selling all this stuff here in the temple. I mean, why don't you think about it? He didn't say that. He went in and threw them out and used a scourge to get his way. Because he was, so he got provoked. But it says not easily provoked. Okay? Jesus, God, is the one who had long suffered with the people of Israel ever since Isaac and Jacob came along. God had long suffered with them, and no, God was not easily provoked. That was displayed in the wilderness. How many times did God have to put up with them and what they were doing and the sins they were committing? How many prophets He sent to them? How many good things he gave to them? How many chances he gave to them? Over and over and over until finally God said, I got to write you a bill of divorce because I'm, I'm not going to take this anymore. So it doesn't have anything to do with not ever being provoked. 
but it does have to do with not being easily provoked. And you know that you really love somebody when you're willing to put up with their sin, when you're willing to put up with them making mistakes. Uh, I don't like men who have no tolerance for their wife or their children. I got no use for you. I got no, I've got no use for women who always stomp to get their way every time and they're not going to put up with anything from a husband, they're going to put up with anything from children. I got no use for you. I got no use for pastors who require strict obedience from church members that, he, that they must do everything the way he likes it, must do everything his way. I got no use for guys like that because they don't know anything about love. They are always easily provoked something to guard against something to watch out for um, uh, thinketh no evil I'm going to finish out this verse thinketh no evil and by that I think revenge revenge plotting to get back at somebody for something they did Plotting to get even. Plotting to you sit and think about. And I know sometimes you can't control your thoughts, but when they come in, God tells you to cast those things out because they're little Jezebels, what they are. I get this picture of casting out, casting down imaginations, and that's what this is. Thinking evil is from your imagination. And Jezebel to me represents that. And those three or four. Uh, eunuchs that Jehu said who's on the Lord's side and these guys stood up and he said throw her out the window so they tossed her out that's casting down imaginations okay and yes we get these thoughts that's normal to think things against people but you know as well as I do that the longer that that seed germinates the harder it is to not gonna to not act on it Okay, and uh, I mean, I'm talking to you from a stance of being guilty of it myself. Letting things germinate in my mind to the point to where there was no way I wasn't going to act on it. To get revenge on somebody or to give them back as good as I got or to give them back worse than what I got. Because we're not going to be even. I'm going to be satisfied at the end of the day. That's how I've thought about things before and it's not right. These are all the things, I mean, ask yourself the question, did you spank your children for every single infraction? No. You didn't whip them for every little thing. Uh, you didn't tuck the sheets in. You made the bed, you didn't tuck the sheets in. Bend over. You didn't do that. If you did, I don't like you. Okay? Because you're not right. That's not training children. Fathers, love your children. Provoke not anger. Provoke them not to anger or something like that. Provoke not your children to wrath is what it says. Okay? God does not deal with us that way. He does not punish us for each and every infraction that we do against Him. He does not do us that way. He does not sit and think about how he's going to get even with us or he's going to get satisfaction on us for what we did. Neither should we think that way toward anybody else. My mind is sometimes it's best to let it go and I know how hard that is. I know how hard that is. But this is why we're, we're to learn these things. This is charity. This is what it's all about. This is what it takes. Heavenly Father, I pray dear God that you'd bless the word. Pray, Lord, that it would have reached somebody today. And Father, these are all things, God, that I am absolutely guilty of. So I cannot teach them, Lord, from the perspective of I've not done these wrong and I expect everybody to shape up or ship out. God, you've not cast me aside. You've not thrust me away. You've been very, very good to me. You've acted, Lord, 
in a way that tells me that you do love me. So Father, help me to love my wife that way. Help me to love my children that way. Help me to love my church that way. My friends and all of my enemies. Help me to love them that way. Because that's what I really want to do. I don't like the baggage that I carry around against people. Because it just it doesn't serve any function, doesn't serve any purpose. And Father, help me to forgive. Help me to move on. Help me to love people the way you love me. Bless your word, we pray in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen.